Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the History Center. I'm Annie Johnson, I'm the museum manager. Uh, today, the United States has the highest rate of incarceration in the world, and it disproportionately <laughs> targets African Americans and Native Americans. Contemporary discourse lays the responsibility for our rate of incarceration in Ronald Reagan's war on crime, but the roots go back to Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty, which empowered the federal government to militarize local police forces and incentivize social service alliances with police, courts, and prisons. By the 1980s, Republicans and Democrats alike had turned to crime control and imprisonment as the cures for poverty and inequality. How did the land of the free become the home of the world's largest prison system? To shed light on these questions, today we welcome Elizabeth Hinton, Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at Yale University and a law professor at Yale School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth to the History Center. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Annie, thank you so much for that introduction. And I also would like to thank um, Danielle Dart for inviting me to come speak to you today. Annie, also for your work in making this happen. And most of all, to all of you for coming and those of you who are tuning in virtually, good morning as well. Um, I really am, am just thrilled to be with you today. As those of you here in Minneapolis know pretty much better than anyone, uh, during the summer of 2020, Americans witnessed what is perhaps the largest mass mobilization in American history, sparked, of course, by the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin in May 2020, as well as that of 26-year-old Breonna Taylor by Louisville police officers and 25-year-old Ahmaud Arbery by a white father and son in southern Georgia. Between 15 and 26 million people protested anti-Black racism and police violence in all 50 states and some 4,444 cities across the planet. Thousands took to the, peak, the streets in peaceful protests the night after Floyd died, demanding justice for his life, demanding that this time the officers involved be held fully accountable for their actions. Minneapolis residents, in turn, responded to the buildup of unanswered grievances and the lack of concrete changes to their immediate living conditions, problems of underprotection, intentional segregation, and the structural exclusion that have only been exacerbated by COVID-19 by using the available resources at their disposal. Throwing rocks, bricks, bottles, and firebombs at buildings, police precincts, and police cruisers, and by taking goods from major retailers such as Target and AutoZone, and then burning these and other institutions like this Arby's to the ground. Police unleashed tear gas and rubber bullets on protesters in response, and the National Guard was deployed. In total that summer, more than 17,000 National Guardsmen patrolled the protests in American cities in 23 states and Washington, D.C. And the Trump administration deployed federal troops to D.C., Portland, Seattle, Kansas City, Chicago, Albuquerque, Cleveland, Detroit, and Milwaukee under Operation Legend and Operation Diligent Valor. Now, Trump had borrowed his law and order presidential campaign rhetoric from Richard Nixon and Make America Great Again from Ronald Reagan. And in the context of the mass protests for Black Lives in 2020, the not so subtle appeals to white racism and the divisions, the authoritarianism of Trumpism made the election about what kind of country we want the United States to be. And those questions have remained or perhaps even grown more pressing after January 6th and with our new administration. So will we, we continue along this undemocratic and misguided policy path that has criminalized marginalized groups and the poorest among us for generations? Or will we finally fulfill the unfinished promises of the abolition of slavery and Jim Crow by supporting the structural transformations and redistributive changes at the national level that tens of millions of people demanded across the United States and the world in the summer of 2020? These are the problems that have been central to American history and why the types of violence we witnessed two summers ago have been a nearly perennial occurrence in the United States after the civil rights movement. When Trump tweeted the day after George Floyd died, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, he was quoting Miami police chief Walter Headley, 
who said the same thing at a press conference in 1967 after Miami similarly exploded. We have not seen a wave of urban violence like this since the long, hot summers of Lyndon Johnson's presidency. Between 1964 and 1972, the United States confronted the greatest moment of sustained domestic violence since the Civil War. And clearly, we've been living in the aftershocks of this period ever since. Every major urban center burned during these eight years, but the violence was not just a problem in archetypal ghettos like Harlem and Watts and in majority black cities like Detroit and Washington, D.C. It could happen in any place where black residents were denied access to political and economic resources and lived in segregated, unequal conditions. Together, these events caused hundreds of millions of dollars of property damage and shaped the lives of the store owners who found their businesses destroyed, the parents who lost their son to riot police, the firefighters and the police officers who were harmed or killed, and millions of other Americans in between. Through the rhetoric of our politicians, media coverage, and much of the academic research on the subject, we've become accustomed to refer to these events from Harlem in 1964 to Minneapolis in 2020 as riots, or what those left of center sometimes refer to as civil disorders. We are then left to view these moments in a historical vacuum as riots, as something meaningless or irrational, devoid, devoid of any political motivation, and ultimately criminal. This is the position from which the Trump administration responded to the violence of 2020 and how President Johnson responded from its inception. Johnson announced following the release of an FBI report on the violence that swept eight cities through the summer of 1964, quote, the riots as well as other criminal and juvenile delinquency problems in our cities are closely connected. Each riot began with a single incident and was aggravated by hoodlums and habitual lawbreakers. Johnson dismissed the possibility that these hoodlums shared many of the same grievances as civil rights protesters. Three years later, Johnson would tell the nation during a televised address delivered in the middle of the unprecedented violence in Detroit in 1967, quote, there is no American right to loot stores or to burn buildings or to fire rifles from rooftops. That is crime. Before this point, Riots in the United States had been mostly carried out by white vigilante mobs who were hostile to integration and who took justice in their own hands, often with the support of local police. A riotous lynch mob as large as 5,000 descended on the black community of Springfield, Illinois in August 1908, randomly destroying black businesses, driving black families from their homes, and executing two black men. Mobs in East St. Louis in 1917 made black wartime factory workers and their families choose between being burned alive or shot to death among other acts of terrorism in one of the bloodiest riots of the 20th century. This white supremacist violence only escalated as black migrants continued to flee the terror of the segregationist South in greater numbers during and after World War I, searching for better opportunities and safety from the white mob. 25 cities erupted during the red summer of 1919 when white and black residents fought and killed each other on the streets of Chicago and Washington, D.C. In Omaha, Nebraska, a mob of at least 10,000 white people stormed the courthouse and demanded the sheriff turn over 40-year-old Will Brown, who had been accused of raping a white woman. The mob eventually broke into the jail, dragged Brown out, and then brutally and viciously tortured him to death. In the rural community of Phillips County, Arkansas, where black tenant sharecroppers were attempting to unionize, white emergency posses killed at least 200 black people. Two years later and a century ago, another 200 would be killed in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in what is known as the Greenwood Massacre, carried out by 2,000 white men who were deputized to commit various atrocities against black residents with the full backing of the county government. And this white supremacist violence continues to pervade American society. Indeed, we saw a reflection of it on January 6th. Although in the post-war period, local police came to assume many of the previous functions of the white mob. 
When white people no longer appear to be the driving force behind rioting in the nation's cities and black collective violence against exclusionary and exploitative institutions surfaced, rioting became associated with criminality and grounded the intensifying clamor for law and order. In the view of President Johnson and others, rioting, rioting and crime were two strains of the same disease in black communities that could only be cured with more police. It was the riffraff of the ghetto who fueled the violence, so the theory went. Criminals, the young, the unskilled, the jobless. They rioted, they burned and looted, seeking momentary thrills to break their tedious lives. Such pathological understandings, never a frame through which authorities understood acts of white terrorism, reinforced the sense of general disorder in urban centers and justified lawmakers' decision to enlist the police to manage that disorder. A proper account of violence in the post-civil rights era depends on our ability to interpret it not as a wave of criminality, but as a period of sustained insurgency. The violence emerged in response to moments of tangibly felt racism, a single incident, as Johnson said, most often touched off by a police encounter. But the tens of thousands of Black Americans who participated in this collective violence were rebelling against past harms, past wrongs, and the systems that preserved unequal conditions over generations. Unlike the Black Panthers, the Black Liberation Army, or other revolutionary groups active during these years, these instinctive community-based rebellions sought concessions from authorities in the areas of employment, housing, education, and law enforcement, and a reordering of the status quo so that Black people would no longer be treated as second-class citizens in their city and in the country. These were the same goals as the civil rights movement more broadly. The violence served as a message to the nation that civil rights reform, an unprecedented war on poverty, and the nonviolent direct action tactics of the civil rights movement were inadequate to solve the problem of racial inequality. Something else was needed. Johnson himself recognized in the same July 1967 speech on Detroit where he linked riding with crime and disentangled it from civil rights protests that, quote, the only genuine long range solution for what happened happened lies in an attack mounted at every level upon the conditions that breed despair and violence. The president's rhetoric indicated that he favored social programs, but in practice, social welfare programs, I should say, but in practice, he increasingly looked to law enforcement as a short-term solution to manage the manifestations of those conditions as they appeared through rioting and crime. Other liberals joined Johnson in this shift through the second half of the 1960s as the rebellions increased in intensity alongside the rollout of civil rights legislation and new job training, remedial education, and community action programs. Even sympathetic officials wondered if perhaps the social welfare intervention had gone too far. Viewed as riots, as criminal acts that could only be controlled with more police, Johnson and other authorities never seriously questioned the way the war on, on crime, launched one year after the war on poverty, may have also been culpable for the violence. Instead, they embraced the expansion of American law enforcement as the best strategy to handle race relations moving forward. The decision to respond to rebellions with police force was not a foregone conclusion. Johnson's own Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, known popularly as the Kerner Commission, offered a promising but unpursued alternative to the escalation of policing and incarceration. In its final report of February 1968, which went on to become a national bestseller, selling over 2 million copies as a mass market paperback, the commission warned federal policymakers and the nation that absent a massive infusion of public resources, promoting a greater access to political and economic institutions, quote, sufficient to make a dramatic, visible impact on life in the urban ghetto, a rising proportion of Negroes in disadvantaged city areas might come to look upon the deprivation and segregation they suffer as proper justification to engage in large-scale violence, followed by white retaliation. The Kerner Commission's grim forecast came to fruition almost immediately and continues to shape American life to this day. Federal policymakers didn't heed the warnings of the Kerner Commission or take seriously what residents told elected officials, newspaper authorities, and researchers about how the fires could be prevented in the future. Nor did authorities take the persistence of rebellion as an indication that the strategy of increasing state surveillance and militarizing crime control forces in Black communities had inflamed the violence that officials wanted to prevent. 
but the Johnson administration blamed the riots on black men between the ages of 15 and 24 and developed a new national law enforcement program to target that demographic. When faced with alternatives, lawmakers pursued a punitive path that advanced racial injustice. The rebellions appeared most threatening in the summer of 1967 and in the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in April 1968. Our memory of these incidents largely stops there, but the rebellions endured for years to come. In fact, between May 1968 and December 1972, at least 960 segregated Black communities across the United States witnessed 1,949 separate uprisings, the vast majority in mid-size and smaller cities that scholars and journalists tend to overlook. Through these four years, nearly 40,000 people were arrested, more than 10,000 were injured, and at least 220 people died. Most of the violent encounters involving black residents during this period began in, to, in, the, in response to the policing of ordinary everyday activity. They happened when police broke up community gatherings or when police intervened in matters that could be resolved internally like disputes among friends and family. They happened when police enforced laws that would almost never be applied in white, never be applied to white neighborhoods or in white neighborhoods, like gathering in groups of a certain size or acting like a suspicious person. And likewise, they happened when police failed to extend to residents of color the common courtesies afforded to whites, like allowing white teenagers to drink in a park and arresting black teens for the same behavior. If they would just leave us alone, there would be no trouble, said a black teenage boy who threw rocks in Decatur, Illinois, during an uprising in August 1969. His solution was a straightforward reaction to the obvious. Resistance could be found wherever ordinary life was policed, and often the mere sight of police who could potentially arrest, beat, or even kill you was enough to prompt a violent response. Multiple occasions of seemingly arbitrary or unnecessarily aggressive police interventions accumulated into frustration and set off preemptive violent reactions. And this is what I call the cycle, the recurring pattern of over-policing and rebellion, of police violence and community violence that helped define urban life in segregated low-income communities in the late 60s and 1970s. And it is especially in secondary cities that the war on crime unfolded in its most lasting and influential ways, helping entrench racial inequality and putting this nation on the path to mass incarceration. The Minneapolis-St. Paul area figures prominently in this largely forgotten window of rebellions in this later period. During Labor Day weekend in 1968, the cycle was set in motion when hundreds of mostly young black people in their teens and early 20s gathered downtown at a community dance. And the preemptive application of force, in this case tear gas, on the part of the police brought what should have been a fun event to a violent end. The young partygoers had ventured two miles from the segregated Rondo neighborhood to Stem Hall, where local funk bands, the Exciters and the Blazers, were playing that Friday night. And in anticipation, they had selected cute, freshly pressed outfits to wear, and they had fixed their hair, and some of them probably hoped to dance with their crush or maybe even get past first base. And they weren't there to protest anything. They were, by nonviolent or violent means, they were just there to enjoy themselves. So by 10 p.m., a crowd of 500 had arrived to hear the bands and to move their bodies. And one group of friends, all young men, left the dance floor and headed to the bathroom in Sam Hall's basement where they could hang out away from everyone else. Two cops followed the, groups, the group downstairs. The officers were white and they stood out. Although the policemen were off duty and not in uniforms, they came to Sem Hall with their guns and their radios just in case anything suspicious happened. So the officers walked into the bathroom ready for trouble just as one of the teens they followed pulled a pistol from his jeans to show his friends. In no time, the officers moved in to make an arrest, but they were easily outnumbered and the young, man, the young men began to yell in protest, hoping to keep their friend from getting carted off to jail. Surrounded among the urinals, the officers called for backup, drawing their guns to hold the teens off. And a scuffle ensued, ending with a shot to one of the officers' shoulders and reinforcements arrived around 10.30 p.m. The party goers dancing upstairs were unaware of the standoff taking place below or that anything out of the ordinary had happened until tear gas suddenly came pouring into the hall. It was difficult to see, people's eyes started to tear, their nostrils burned, their throats became clogged as if they were being choked, they coughed as their chest tightened, but it was impossible to find relief because the police had trapped them in STEM hall with the gas using their nightsticks to lock the doors.
Only after all the on-duty police in St. Paul arrived, about 150 officers total, plus five police reinforcements from the Ramsey County, County Sheriff's Office, did police open STEM Hall, and that's what you see in this image. And the youth, anxious and traumatized, poured into the streets to breathe in fresh air. And the first thing they saw was this fleet of law enforcement ready and, and waiting to make arrests or worse. The rock throwing, fire setting, and window breaking that emerged in St. Paul and nearly a thousand black communities during this largely forgotten window occurred after President Johnson signed the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act into law. Johnson had called the war on crime in March 1965, beginning an unprecedented investment in local law enforcement that was prompted in large part by the continued problem of black rebellion. As Americans fought the Vietnam War, federal policymakers ramped up police operations on the home front to battle political radicalism and rebellion, creating a pipeline to deliver surplus army weapons and technologies to local law enforcement. City officials took advantage of the freshly available federal, federal resources to control black neighborhoods. The federal allocation for police forces went from nothing in 1964 to 10 million in 1965, 20.6 million in 1966, 63 million in 1968, 100 million in 1969, and 300 million in 1970. That's a near 3,000% increase in five years. On the ground, this translated to programs that modernized police departments with riot control training and military grade weapons like AR 15s and M4 carbines, helicopters, steel helmets, three foot batons, masks, armored vehicles, two way radios, tear gas, and a handful of low cost police community relations initiatives thrown in for good measure. Although black communities had been vulnerable to targeted surveillance, frequent encounters with police, mass arrests, illegal searches, and outright brutality in the century after emancipation, the enactment of the Safe Streets Act meant that residents in segregated low-income neighborhoods in big cities like Chicago, mid-sized cities like Phoenix, and smaller cities like West Point, Georgia, would be patrolled by police departments with an arsenal of riot control equipment at their disposal. By 1970, federal policymakers had allocated some $40 million, or about $300 million in today's dollars, on such equipment for law enforcement. At the same time, the Safe Streets Act, with its initial $330 million outlay for crime control, supported the influx of police officers in urban areas that seemed prone to rebellion. The Johnson administration in Congress believed that increasing police patrols and granting weapons arsenals to police departments under the banner of the war on crime would function as the most powerful deterrent to disorder in the short term. As such, police were deployed in neighborhoods with high rates of reported crime that seemed vulnerable to rebellion in anticipation of future violence. Rather than responding to incidents that had already recurred, at, occurred, as is the case in uh, middle class and white communities, in low income communities of color, police were tasked with identifying a group that the Johnson administration in Congress called potential delinquents or potential criminals and arresting them before they went on to cause trouble or harm. This preemptive strategy explains why the plainclothes officers were surveilling the dance at STEM Hall in the first place with their guns and their radios. Now, tensions between black residents and the mostly white St. Paul Police Department with only four black officers in its rank and file were already high at the time of the Stem Hall Rebellion in 1968. The city had been alert on high alert since the uprising in nearby Minneapolis during the previous summer of 1967, when an officer threw two black teenage girls to the ground during an altercation at the city's Aquaten Aquatennial Torchlight Parade and hundreds of black residents mobilized to hold the officers accountable. After the police arrived at the protest and a cop hit a pregnant, a pregnant woman's belly, residents fought back. They hurled rocks at police and Molotov cocktails at buildings. The National Guard and state troopers assisted local police in bringing the violence to an end after four nights. When the young people came pouring out of STEM Hall that Friday, the police instructed all attendees to disperse and go home. Most followed orders, but about 150 remained, a match for the police force. The night had ended much earlier than expected, and the teenagers were just getting going. Their rides home had yet to arrive, and many of the concert goers wondered where to go next and what to do, and many of them were angry, having just been violently tear-gassed for um, no apparent reason. 
As the local chapter of the Urban Coalition, Coalition wrote, observed later in a report, quote, the gas affected the crowd indiscriminately. It is clear that from the time the gas was thrown into the hall, a wider disturbance was beyond prevention. This cycle of over-policing and community rebellion was not unique to St. Paul. It played out frequently through the early years of the war on crime. Just three weeks before the incident in, at Stem Hall in Racine, Wisconsin, a fight between two attendees at a dance held at Washington Park High School led to police tear gassing a crowd of 250 black teenagers. The youth proceeded to move through the streets of the black neighborhood in the south side of the city, smashing store windows, stoning cars, and setting fires, much as like, like their counterparts did in St. Paul, as we'll see. In Harrisburg, the state capital of Pennsylvania, a peaceful protest against police brutality in June 1969 quickly turned into a rebellion lasting for several days after police tear gas an angry crowd. The violence ended only after a black high school student was shot and killed by a local policeman who claimed the teenager was preparing to ignite a Molotov cocktail. As in Racine and Harrisburg, the decision on the part of St. Paul police to throw gas grenades at a grouping of residents created violence, even if the purpose was to prevent it before it began. Some of the teens began hurling bricks, bottles, rocks, and even chairs at police outside of St. Paul. They taunted them. After a rock hit an officer in the head, causing him to fall to the ground, the police felt they had to move in to break up the crowd by force. The youth quickly split up, running in two opposite directions, and the police followed their lead, separating to pursue both groups simultaneously as the teens made their way back to their small, often deteriorating homes while smashing the windows of white-owned businesses, breaking into cars and stores, assaulting white civilians, and pulling fire alarms along the way. Black residents in St. Paul and in Racine and Harrisburg and in thousands of communities across the United States were fighting back against more than just the police officers who interrupted them or brutalized them as they went about their daily lives. Although the tactics may have differed, the people who attacked police, smashed windows, set fires, and plundered local stores shared the same demands as the mainstream civil rights movement. They were fighting against the process of their own criminalization, as well as making unanswered calls for socioeconomic inclusion and against racism more broadly. At the time, the conditions in the city's Rondo community, home to 85% of St. Paul's Black residents, cl clearly resembled that of Harlem, Watts, Detroit, and other low-income Black communities across the United States that had also erupted. With just over 300,000 residents, the Black population in St. Paul had surged 35% as Southern migrants fled the terror of the Jim Crow South in the two decades leading up to the uprising. As the flood of newcomers settled in the Rondo neighborhood through the 50s and early 1960s, a total of more than 1,000 units in the area had been demolished to make way for the building of Interstate 94, causing a severe shortage of low-income housing that provided tenants with standard, even decent conditions, and segregation remained a problem. As St. Paul became a blacker city, middle-class white residents moved to modern, more comfortable housing at affordable prices in the suburbs. Black residents were essentially limited to segregated projects where the housing authority was unresponsive or often insensitive, or to the oldest housing stock in the city, where slum landlords, who were very rare, rarely subject to housing inspections, allowed the dwellings to deteriorate further while charging exorbitant rent prices. Urban renewal policies and neglect left, left the already vulnerable Rondo district vastly overcrowded. Adding to these desperate conditions, Black residents paid more for decrepit homes in St. Paul and many other cities as they suffered from a rate of unemployment that, is more, that was more than three times that of their white counterparts, and those with jobs were most often in the lowest paying, unskilled sector. As a result, 26% of Black residents in St. Paul lived below the poverty line, more than double the, the rate of white households in the city. Although craft trades and apprenticeship programs had recently opened to Black residents, affirmative action measures had made a very minor impact in changing the overall situation. And the public schools, which the state had flagged as racially imbalanced for the segregation within them, even in the late 1960s, 15 or so years after Brown, were becoming increasingly punitive for Black students who, who were frequently suspended and who dropped out at disparate rates. In effect, by holding a group of young people from the Rondo community at gunpoint, unnecessarily tear gassing several hundred more, and carting off dozens of others to the city jail, 
The St. Paul police set the cycle in motion as the night went on and seriously injured at least 30 black residents in the process. Rebellions persisted after 1972, although not with the frequency of those in the immediate post-King era, further demonstrating that aggressive policing tends to incite violence as it did in St. Paul, but it incites violence especially when protests, residents are protesting the very thing that they are then subjected to. The conditions that bred the police encounters and legal injustices that precipitated the St. Paul Rebellion and others of the fiery 60s and early 1970s and in the 80s and 90s and today would not have happened and could have been avoided entirely had national pol policymakers and law enforcement authorities decided to respond in a different way to the protests of the civil rights era in both its nonviolent and violent forms. Prevailing interpretations view the rebellions as a break from the nonviolent direct action protest tactics of the civil rights movement. This second reconstruction, which sought to meet the unfulfilled promises of the Civil War and its aftermath, aimed to integrate American society and extend the bounds of citizenship. It secured the right to an education, to shop at certain stores or eat in certain restaurants, and to vote. It made racism no longer acceptable in American public discourse and created a growing black middle class. But with the war on crime came new forms of social control and with them a new form of resistance. Indeed, King's death in 68 and the collective sorrow, anger, and disillusionment that followed it marked a turning point for the mainstream civil rights movement and its emphasis on nonviolence, a strategy that had failed to protect its most visible proponent from the violent forces of racism and seemed to many incapable of securing true freedom for black Americans. As the rising generation saw it, the sit-ins, marches, boycotts, voter registration drives, and legal challenges that defined Black politics in the post-war era had not addressed structural inequalities or provided protection from the lived realities of police and white supremacist violence. The young people rebelling understood their predecessors to have, to have failed. They looked back on the heyday of the civil rights movement, and they looked at the conditions they were currently living in at the end of the 1960s with police watching them from the other side of the park, and they rebelled. This was the most widely adopted form of protest among young black people from King's assassination until the early 1970s. Even if they did not participate and often served important roles in calming the, the violence, many older residents res resonated with and admired the determination of those who stood up to the forces of anti-Black racism with rocks and fire. As a Black act activist in Alexandria, Virginia put it, quote, the expression the youngsters put forth is a deep and hidden expression of older Blacks. Approaching adulthood in the era of Black power, young Black Americans were emboldened with a kind of courage to meet Black police violence with violence that perhaps the previous generations could not have possessed. An older Black resident in New York, Pennsylvania, a city which suffered from one of the most devastating rebellions of the era in the summer of 1969, one that involved the twin forces of police violence and white vigilante terror, explained, quote, the cops are out shooting people shooting at people or busting heads, and you go down to City Hall, and they say they didn't do it, and that's all there is to it. You can't buck City Hall. We've been going to City Hall for years. Somebody's going to have to get hurt. That's all there is to it. If government authorities were unwilling to protect Black residents from police brutality, then self-defense, a politics Black Americans had historically adopted under white terrorism and government complacency in an attempt to create safer conditions in their communities presented itself as a rational alternative. By their actions, those who participated in the rebellions argued that violence was a necessary strategy to secure economic access and full civic inclusion for not just Black people, but for all Americans. It can be a struggle to imagine the young people who threw rocks at police or who looted local businesses or who defiantly walked through the rubble and the aftermath of rebellion as political actors. And this bias has influenced the writing of history. Even scholars and activists interested in forms of resistance to systemic racism have been reluctant to take seriously the political nature of black rebellion. Yet just as much as nonviolent direct action, Rebellion presented a way for people of color to express collective solidarity in the face of exploitation, political exclusion, and criminalization. 
and arguably the success of nonviolent direct political action that characterized the civil rights movement depended on the presence of violent direct political action. As Martin Luther King Jr. himself recognized, the power of mass nonviolence arose in part from its ability to suggest the coercive power of violent resistance should demands not be met. Therefore, when we reflect on Black protests, past, present, and future, we should endeavor to see both its violent and nonviolent expressions as entwined forces. And to do that, we should attempt to understand violent rebellion on its own terms as a form of protest that has been just as integral to the history of the United States and freedom movements. The large-scale rebellions of the last decades of the 20th century and early 21st, Miami in 1980, Los Angeles in 1992, and Cincinnati in 2001, share many of the same causes and characteristics as the collective violence of the earlier period. But these rebellions and the political violence that followed beginning in the mid-2010s emerge in response to grave miscarriages of justice, like the acquittal of the four Los Angeles police officers who savagely beat Rodney King in the first viral police brutality video, and also to exceptional incidents of police brutality, like the fatal shooting of Michael Brown by Ferguson police eight days after he graduated high school. They emerge in response to the way policing measures advance an inherently racist criminal legal system that disproportionately ensnared millions of women and men of color, deepening segregation and inequality in the process. Taken together, the history of this violence demonstrates that patrolling low-income neighborhoods with outside forces does not effectively control crime. In fact, it establishes a dynamic where residents and officers view each other as the enemy, rendering both sides less safe. Had policymakers and officials at all levels of government taken the opportunity to view the rebellions as a, as a moment to seriously listen to residents' demands, contend with underlying socioeconomic causes that Johnson's own Kerner Commission identified, and reconsider the purpose and function of police, the negative consequences of the, the punitive approach to urban problems might have been avoided entirely. The most important lesson from the rebellions that police violence precipitates community violence escaped policymakers and the scholars they consulted. Instead, led by the national government, authorities further criminalized entire communities where unrest materialized for the remainder of the 20th century and still today, allocating billions of taxpayer dollars into the wars on crime and drugs and gangs and mass incarceration that represent not only gross violations of civil liberties, but are arguably the biggest domestic policy failures in the history of the United States. People of color continue to be much more likely to suffer harm or death with police lingering in their community, either by each other or by an officer whose job it is to, whose, whose job it is to ostensibly protect them. George Floyd is a legacy of this policy path sustained over five decades. But what's especially no notable about the wave of protests sparked by his murder in the summer of 2020 is that it diverged in critical ways from the rebellions of the late 60s and early 70s and from the massive conflagrations that came after from Miami to Los Angeles. Unlike most previous rebellions, which typically began with demonstrators throwing rocks, bottles, and other objects when police arrived to patrol their communities, the demonstrations from Ferguson in 2014 onwards all began as peaceful marches and vigils in response to flagrant acts of police violence. When police responded aggressively to these nonviolent protesters, some of the demonstrations quickly turned violent, as here in Minneapolis. So although the nature of the historic protests in 2020 resembled the civil rights marches of the first half of the 1960s more than the violent protests later in the decade, according to the Washington Post, 96% of the protests in 2020 were entirely nonviolent, authorities frequently responded as they had in those later years. They fired pepper spray canisters, beat protesters with riot sticks, imposed curfews, made arrests, and in some places, called in the National Guard and federal troops. And here we are, nearly two long COVID years after George Floyd, and still very much in the cycle of both policing and of punitive policies. Conservative lawmakers across the country have responded to the tens of millions of people who took to the streets by emboldening law enforcement to crack down on those who might protest for racial justice in the future. <clears throat> 
They have introduced new criminal penalties for protesting and have made exercising your First Amendment rights punishable by harsh prison sentences. There's a law currently pending here in Minnesota that would impose stiff penalties on peaceful protesters who intentionally disrupt traffic on a freeway or roadway, a tactic that activists have used to advance racial justice since the civil rights movement and has kind of had a resurgence in the era of Black Lives Matter. Another law would broadly disqualify a person convicted of an offense during a protest from receiving a range of public benefits, including food stamps, education loans and grants, and unemployment. Under the bill, a person convicted of even a misdemeanor that is deemed somehow related to their participation in a peaceful protest could face permanent disqualification from such benefits. So if this law does pass, be careful if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. <coughs> Republican legislators, legislat legislators in 20 states have already passed similar anti-riot bills, as they are called, in the past year. Meanwhile, in the aftermath of calls to defund the police and invest in alternatives outside of law enforcement to prevent crime, the Biden administration and Congress have embraced policies to refund the police. When homicides surged in nearly every American city in 2020 at rates the nation had not seen since the mid-1990s, the enduring violence should have been taken as evidence that traditional public safety models have failed. Yet President Biden offered a prevention strategy that would use part of the $350 billion American Rescue Plan to hire even more officers in Chicago, New York, and other cities that experience alarming spikes in gun violence and pay their overtime. Federal stimulus money that was intended to address the severe impact of, on, of the COVID-19 pandemic on public health and economic outcomes, outcomes that affected black and brown communities disproportionately, is now being used to encourage states to expand resources for policing, a policy approach that Biden just championed in his State of the Union address when he said, fund the police. As in the era of rebellion in the 1960s and early 1970s, Liberal and conservative policymakers alike are today championing law enforcement over supporting vital social programs in neighborhoods where schools are underfunded, where community centers and after school programs for children have long been closed, where public parks are not maintained, and where the water is not safe to drink. Disinvestments that, over generations, have made these same communities vulnerable to both police violence and community violence. The most effective approaches to crime prevention involve programs that respond to community needs and grant control of public safety to residents, especially in areas where the state has failed. New investments into preschool programs, job creation measures, mental health treatment, college, scholarship, college, scholar, college scholarships, decent affordable housing, and reconstituting the criminal legal system based on the principle of repair instead of retribution would make for a safer society and a stronger democracy. Police are the default response to violence and other crises in low-income neighborhoods of color, but community needs can and should be met by the people. In the era of civil rights and rebellion, sustained political action and sustained visibility forced lawmakers to listen. In the wake of George Floyd's murder, the resulting mass mobilizations, and surging white supremacy, some lawmakers and the public are listening again. The challenge of the 21st century is to actually bring about change. We as a nation still fail to reckon with the history of Black Rebellion and with the wisdom Martin Luther King Jr. prophetically offered towards the end of his life that only, quote, social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. There is no other answer. Constructive social change will bring certain tranquility. Evasions will merely encourage turmoil. More than a half century after King's insights, it is clear that America will continue to catch the fires of rebellion until the structures of racial inequality are finally dismantled and the police are no longer empowered by authorities to manage the material consequences of conditions that are beyond their control. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing that with us. Uh, questions from the audience? Raise your hand if you have one for Elizabeth, and I'll come up. Um, and Megan, I don't know if we have any from online. You know, Martin Luther King, uh, most of his successes were in the um, Upper South, smaller, quite smaller cities, Selma, and like that. But he was uh, very unsuccessful when he, when he moved north 
and into larger into into larger urban centers. Mm -hmm. How has you know, and that that seems that you know things are still in that situation in that condition. You want, you, would you please comment on that? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think you know part of it is that um, the, we have this kind of view, really kind of regional binary view, where a lot of the unique um, forms of racial discrimination that Black people and people of color face in Northern states, um, we don't really talk about. You know, the, the struggle to dismantle Jim Crow, obviously in the North, there were many legal restrictions, but not the kind of um, rigid segregation of Jim Crow. There was mob violence in the North, some of which I talked about in the, in the talk, but not the same kind of constant everyday terrorism and threat of lynching that occurred in the South. And I think especially even in the early 1960s, that break that I talked about um, that happened, that really took off after King's death, and that is the kind of tension between nonviolent direct action and um, self-defense uh, began to kind of grow larger and larger, where you, know, you begin to get a, a kind of militant protest coming out of many um, major urban centers that that's advocating self-determination, that's, um, that's, that's calling for by 1966, black power, um, and the, the kind of the, the nonviolent direct action strategies of King and other um, leaders within this, the SCLC and the Southern Civil Rights Movement um, were in tension with um, how this younger generation that I talked about was conceiving of what strategies would actually, um, you know, achieve the kind of results they wanted. Of course, again, in the Jim Crow South, um, you know, declaring black power, it was our, our already, um, you know, nonviolent direct action, uh, civil rights organizers were criminalized and arrested for their behavior and had to act or for their politics and had to act very, very carefully under the constant threat of white supremacist terrorism. And so, you know, the, the movement in the North as it began to develop even earlier in the 1960s was able to take a kind of more um, militant and unabashedly black nationalist uh, tone, um, embracing those the set of strategies that were advocating for self-defense and, um, you know, by the end of the decade or by the mid to late 1960s with groups like the Black Panthers um, revolution. Uh, I want to thank you for writing your two books, the research for those, those were very enlightening. But I have a two-part question. One is Eric Adams seems to be going backwards with the broken window concept. Do you think in your in your expert with your expertise that that will actually increase violence in New York City? And the second part is do you how integral is integration as far as reducing crime and having more opportunities for people of color? Thank you first so much for engaging um, my, my books, my work that really means a lot to me and for these um, terrific questions. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that I tried to stress in the talk um, is that this, this type of policing really doesn't work. You know, the, 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 the constant, the policy cycle and the decision to respond to um, unequal conditions that breed crime and violence with more police hasn't worked. We've been doing this since Johnson called the war on crime essentially in 65. We've been doing this for more than 50 years. And in many vulnerable communities, um, gun violence has not um, decreased. So that, you know, this, if, if we were measuring a different kind of program, we would say this is a policy failure. Um, and so this policy path to continually just lean on police as the solution, um, again, hasn't worked. So if we're going back to broken windows policing, we know that what this does is round people up, um, fill up prisons, which are criminogenic in itself, and people end up and uh, going in and out of, of prison. So, um, and crime increases, which is related to the second question about integration. And I think, you know, again, the, the Kerner Commission in 68 had it right. Um, you know, they said, if we really want, you know, if, if we really want to make a meaningful dent um, in addressing the problem of racial discrimination, if we if we're really serious about creating safe communities, what we need to do is go well beyond the war on poverty and we need essentially a Marshall Plan for American cities. Um, you know, the Kerner Commission did say 
integration, they, they really, they put integration as kind of the platform of that. But I think even more important than integration is, is getting resources, um, redistributing resources in this country more equitably. And that was true in 1968 and that was true now. And so the, the challenge really is building the political will to do that because it's easy to say that, right? But it's, it's incredibly different, difficult to actually do this especially in the current climate, but um, to get people to see that, um, that in a country that is as affluent as the United States, um, with the resources that we have, there's, there should be no reason for people to be living, of all races, to be living in the kind of poverty um, that some people in this country are living in, and the way that racism and race shapes um, very much, you know, which, which groups are excluded from resources. So I think that's that's really what the goal should be rather than integration in itself. Um, just sort of to follow up on what you've been saying, it seems to me like I've lived in my life at least through four or five administrations where the war on crime just keeps on coming back. It's a proven tool. It works very well. Fear works well for people. And we all know what it looks like because we've seen examples of it. So there's sort of like this template out there. I'm not so sure we have a template for what a community would look like without that. And I'm just wondering where do we find that template? Yeah, so, you know, there's a, um, th there's, a there's another precedent from the, the Lyndon Johnson era, um, which is of course the, the principle of maximum feasible participation, which was what um, Congress used to kind of guide the very early war on poverty which is, you know, essentially um, for the only, unfortunately, the first year of the war on poverty, the federal government was granting local groups money directly um, because the idea was that um, poor people knew better how to solve poverty in their own communities rather than outsiders coming in. And, um, you know, empowering grassroots groups to address poverty on their own terms um, actually did really lead to a much more robust um, democracy in many communities. It led to voter registration drives. It led to low-income people challenging um, slum landlords. It led to, it gave people an outlet where they could begin to address um, social conditions in their communities that empowered, um, you know, mentorship groups for, for young people who were at risk of committing crime or delinquency. And unfortunately, this was a very, very um, short-lived aspect of the war on poverty because by 1965, local officials who didn't like this, um, this, this maximum feasible participation or community action program idea because you know, it was essentially funding uh, grassroots mobilization, um, you know, resisted it. And soon Congress uh, institutionalized the war on poverty and um, made local officials and eventually police officers gave them much more prominent ro roles in the administration of programs. And so I think, you know, one thing is, is trying to um, prop up many of these types of organizations at the same scale that we prop up things like police officers. A more recent example, um, and this actually President Biden mentioned um, in his speech on gun violence last June, are groups like um, Advanced Peace out of Sacramento, which essentially um, target mostly young men of color who are vulnerable to getting shot or to shooting other people. And instead of police being first responders or locking those young men up in juvenile detention centers, um, men in the community who themselves as younger people had been involved in gang violence or in violent activity come in and mentor the youth. They give them support, they gave them resources. Again, the importance of resources. Um, and programs like Advanced Peace have had a real impact on gun violence in the communities where they've been implemented. That's why President Biden, the, the Advanced Peace has been around for about 15 years now and President Biden really propped it up in that speech. Um, and these are the kinds of programs that we need to begin to fund more of in part because they're a lot cheaper than police programs. They're a lot cheaper than locking people up. Um, and they're, they, they actually prove to be much more successful. Hi, this is Megan from the Zoom call. We have several questions now. Um, so Annie, you'll have to help us with timing. Um, our first question is, how do riots at prisons like at the St. Cloud Reformatory during this same period fit into this picture? 
That's a great question. So at this at the same time that that these thousands of rebellions are happening, there are of course um, prison rebellions happening, especially the 1971 uh, rebellion in Attica at Attica Prison in New York, which was probably the largest uh, rebellion at at the time. And of course, you know, again, I mean, the what's happening in the, the prison rebellions are, you know, in a kind of, in a, in a, in a contained, are happening in a contained space, but are also very much part of a larger response to um, systemic inequalities and living conditions, in, in this case, in the prison. Um, but it's, you know, it's the, the rebellions on the streets in many ways parallel the rebellions in the prisons. And of course, as a result of the war on crime and the result of the kind of um, targeted deployment, the expansion and militarization of police forces in low income communities of color. Um, you get more people arrested, you get more people being sent to prison. Um, and this is the moment when, well, I guess a few years later, 1973, the majority of US prison populations go for the first time in US history from being majority white to being majority um, black and brown. And in this moment when you know the war on crime is happening and prisons are getting blacker and browner, conditions are worsening, you're beginning to see overcrowding, all of these things kind of come together to create a cocktail um, of, of, of protest and rebellion. Obviously the conditions inside prisons themselves are different than what people are living in in, in uh, low income communities of color, but in many ways they're rooted in the same systemic um, grievances, so it's not surprising that um, so many prison rebellions also occur during this moment. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question um, is from an anonymous attendee. I have friends who think the riot at the Capitol on January 6th is not as bad as the riots, uh, presumably that you've been discussing, due to police violence in Minneapolis and elsewhere. I have tried to explain the difference, but to no avail, do you have any insights? Well, first, you know, and, and this is, so this is the equivalency, right, that especially many um, conservative lawmakers have made, even though, you know, the mob on the 6th um, was, was one, I mean, let's think about scale, was literally trying to overthrow the results of a legitimate election, um, brought nooses to hang, to publicly hang uh, the Speaker of the House and the Vice President. Um, and, and as part of a larger movement that I see um, as really antithetical to the um, founding democratic principles of the United States, that saying that this country is, is, is only meant for certain groups of people and, um, and the votes of, um, of you know, the people who democratically elected President Biden don't count that there's some that because these people are these people are criminals, they're frauds, and the election was stolen, right? Um, Black Lives Matter and the protests for racial justice in 2020 were about creating a, a more equitable and inclusive society. Um, and again, if we look at uh, the police response to both, right? Uh, you know, the, the kind of underlying balance of power couldn't be different. Whereas even in Lafayette Square in DC um, in June, 2020, when, um, when Trump was going for that photo op at, at, um, at the church near the White House and essentially deployed um, the US Park Service and US Marshals um, and police officers, on peaceful protesters and tear gas them stands in marked contrast to the way that some um, of the police officers, many of the police officers, of course, during the six were extremely brave and courageous in their actions, but some of them opened the door um, for those who were trying to attack the Capitol and took selfies with them. Um, protests for racial justice from the Montgomery bus boycott um, on down have always been criminalized and met with police brutality where this kind of long history of white supremacist violence that I've been laying out is always kind of met with this or is frequently met with a kind of police uh, complacency. Um, so, so, so that's what I would, it, it's, a, it's, it's totally a false um, equivalency. Great, our next question is, do you know of any cities that have reallocated police funds to social programs or paired police with significant increases in community-based social programs? So one um, 
interesting development is happening in Ithaca, um, New York, where the, and this happened last year, um, where the police department and the police union, which is really surprising, voted to abolish the police department and rename it the um, Department of Community Public Safety um, and have begun to implement many of the um, policing reforms that, um, that people have been talking about for years. So including, you know, not having um, uh, a armed officer um, perform routine traffic stops. So, you know, already um, de-escalating those routine traffic stop situations that we know um, all too frequently can, um, re can result in injury or even death. Um, they've also empowered mental health professionals to respond to many incidents that are like family disputes that are better, better handled by um, social work professionals than uniformed officers with guns, which can often escalate situations. Um, and part of that money too are, is going to um, community-based programs to promote some of the things that I talked about at the end, that is early childhood education, job training for youth. Um, so in some cities, I mean, Ithaca, of course, is a university town. So, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a long way to go, um, but, you know, we're beginning to see these kind of new conceptions of public safety take hold. The question is, you know, in, in the era, as I said, Biden, um, the State of the Union said, fund the police and, and the backlash against that unfortunate slogan. Um, you know, the question is whether or not those, those innovative public safety models will actually take off. Elizabeth, thank you again so much for coming out today. That's the time we have for questions. Thank you all so much for coming and your wonderful questions. <laughs>